Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 20. We'll go there in just a moment. Jeremiah chapter 20. So very thankful for Jerry. He always does a good job with those announcements. And thank you for Brother Mike for that wonderful prayer. And Greg for those songs. Us. Songs that Brother Greg led here this morning I think are going to go quite well with the topic that we'll discuss this morning. The idea is for us to have a, an uplifting type lesson, one that may encourage us, although there are some negative points that we will make, but overall I hope this lesson will be very encouraging. As we think about what keeps us keep on keeping on. Why do we venture on? The word venture means to proceed, especially in the face of danger. So why do we not allow the world or sin or Satan to step in our way and turn us from the gospel? Because this is actually what we do, is that we proceed in the face of danger. There's a danger of us losing relationships with our friends. There's danger of us losing relationships with our loved ones. There's dangers as in the past we've seen, maybe not so much in this country, but in other countries. It may be right around the corner that we may lose our physical freedom. And there are have been in the past dangers of those losing their physical life by trying to proclaim the gospel and by keeping on and looking toward the gospel and living by that gospel. In Jeremiah chapter 20, let's look at verse 9. We know Jeremiah had a lot on his mind in his life in the, the 40 years that he was preaching to the nation of Judah. But in verse 9, then I said, I will make not mention of him nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah thought about maybe for a split second or a brief moment about quitting what he was doing. And I can only imagine how discouraged Jeremiah would have been, but... But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Jeremiah couldn't quit. He kept on keeping on. Jeremiah could not stop from laboring in the vineyard. He could not contain the fire that was inside him. He could not refrain from traveling on. And how sad it would have been to preach to a nation for 40 years and not be able to see any visible results. We may find ourselves in a similar situation in our lives. We speak to our friends and our loved ones, but yet we can't turn them to the truth, can't turn them away from the world. Things may get very discouraging. We may at some point in time feel like we want to give up, but we don't, do we? At least I hope that we never will. We travel on, we venture on, we labor on. So like Jeremiah, the fire burns inside us and we reflect on that and ask why. It is not in man to direct his own steps, Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. When, as we walk, and we walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. And we acquire that faith by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So why don't we be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 and let us examine what God's Word has to say about these things. Let us examine why we labor on. I have three points I'd like to make this morning about why we labor on. One of them negative and two of them positive. The first one is we labor on because we know what sin can do. Sin is a destroyer. It destroys everything it comes in contact with and it will destroy our lives. It does destroy lives. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, we have the instance where Samuel has his first vision or his first revelation from God. God is speaking to him and at first he didn't know what it was. He asked Eli about it. And Eli gave him some instruction and God came to Samuel there and spoke to him and told him of what was going to happen to Eli and his sons. And in chapter 3 and verse 13 and 14, the American Standard says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever, speaking of Eli, for the iniquity which he knew. 
Eli knew what his sons had been doing because his sons did bring a curse upon themselves and he restrained them not. Eli obviously did not do everything that was in his power to try to redirect his sons and try to teach his sons. Even though Eli may have been a devout man and and uh, his desire was to be in keeping with God's will, he did not do everything that he should have done in restraining his sons. Verse 14, And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expatiated. Or in other words, it may not be atoned for, it may not be cleansed with sacrifice nor offering forever. Sin here destroyed the lives of Eli and his two sons. Eli's sons perished when they took the Ark of the Covenant. And Eli perished soon after that, falling backwards and breaking his neck as an old man. Well, how does sin destroy our lives? Well, some leave the faith. We call it apostasy when someone turns from the faith. It is a total desertion or of a departure of one's religion and it brings about pain and sadness to those that love that individual, those that surround those people that may do that. What causes this? Sin is the, is the cause of it. Sin will destroy our lives. Some become addicted to things. An addiction is a state of being enslaved to a habit or practice. Maybe things like alcohol, drugs. They may be prescription. They may be illegal. It may be something like pornography. It may be gambling. It may be in some other impulse. Maybe shopping or something along those lines that we have that something we can't contain. It may be Work, maybe school, some of these things, any and everything that Satan can take and use against us to try to interfere with our lives, to try to interfere with our responsibilities and our relationships, and most importantly, interfere with our faithfulness to God. Satan will use these things. And what causes these? Sin. Some people are affected by pride. This world is greatly affected by pride. Solomon in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. James also had something to say about pride. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. James chapter 4 and verse 6. Pride is defined as a high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority, whether as cherished in the mind or as displayed in bearing conduct, etc. It's the idea that my needs and my wants are what's most important. I know better than what God knows. We see that so prevalent today. Some of the, some of the hot topics that are debated on and laws that are being passed. And here recently, some of the laws in relation to abortion will turn your stomach. It's a result of pride. I know better than God. One life is superior to another. Or maybe the argument that they make along the lines of abortion is that that's not even a life. From conception to a minute before birth, we don't have a life. That's what the, the pro-choice crowd will argue, but Jeremiah records different in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It is clear from his statements there, God's statement to Jeremiah that in God's mind, Jeremiah existed or he was a person in his mother's womb from the time of conception. It says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, before Jeremiah took his completed form, God recognized him as a person. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 1, The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, Thus saith Jehovah, who stretched forth the heavens, layeth the foundation of earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Solomon tells us that's a work of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 5, The English Standard Version translates it this way, as you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the wombs of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. It's a work of God. 
The development of the child is equated here with the working of God, the infusion of the Spirit within the body. We don't know how it happens, as Solomon records here. We don't know how it happens, but we know it happens, and we know where it happens. But pride gets in the way of those in the world that want to pass these laws of different things that they can abort babies right up up, up to the minute before they're born. Gender issues is another hot topic. I may have been born a man, but I don't feel like a man today. God got it wrong. Today I'm going to be a woman. Or I was born a woman, but I don't feel like one today. I feel like a man. I think I'm going to be a man. I think I know better than what God knows. Pride. Marriage. God said marriage was between a man and a woman, but I think... Two men can get married or two women can get married. I know better than God knows. See how sin gets in the way? It gets in the way of our worship. People want to bring things that are unauthorized into a worship service because they think that it's better. you got your translations. You can get whatever flavor of the Bible that you want. One man decided that he didn't like something that was written in one part of the Scripture and he wants to change it. Another decides that The Bible needs to read this way, and they decide they want to change it. We call them translations, but they they are better referred to as uh, commentaries. It's what someone thinks it says. It's not the way that it was written. But we understand pride gets in the way of all these things, and that stems from sin. Those refuse to obey the gospel. They know the truth. They believe it. They don't live as the world lives, but yet they're still worldly because they're not a Christian. They're willing to confess Jesus is the Son of God, or at least they claim they are, but yet they won't take that next step, be baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. What holds them back? James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, James goes on and talks about our life being a vapor that's here for a little while, and then it vanishes away. Is it a time issue? Is it, I think I'll have time. I have time. I'll leave, I'll leave the faith, but there's time to come back. I'm battling with these addictions, but there's time to get help later. I enjoy them. I, I, I want to continue to partake in them. There's time for me to become humble. I'll live in my own pride for the time being. There's time to obey. An attitude like this would leave us wrong. And if the Lord came back, we'd be dead wrong. Sin brings shame and misery, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Talking about being ashamed to even talk about those things. And what it's referring to is broadcasting those things or advertising those things. Like, oh, I used to live in that that way. Or, oh, do you hear about what so-and-so did? Those things are a shame. They're evil and they're wicked and they're not pleasing unto God. We don't advertise those things. We understand that sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And as Peter makes mention in 1 Peter 3 and verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those that do evil. So that's the first thing that we know sin. uh, the, The reason we labor on is because we know what sin can do. And sin can destroy a life. So that's the negative. And here's the positive. We labor on because we know what Christ can do. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 7-9, through 9, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins. We know Jesus can cleanse us. Jesus can save us. He can forgive us. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28, when Christ instituted the Lord's Supper there, as they were observing the Passover feast in the upper room, verse 27 says, And He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is My blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. Isn't that beautiful? That we can have forgiveness from sin. 
Friends, that's why we labor on, because we know what we have. We know what we have in Christ. Revelation 1 and verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, so that we can follow and also enjoy that resurrection, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our own sins in his blood. Now, we understand from 1 John chapter 1 there that I read, verses 7 through 9, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We realize that we do sin. We continue to sin after being cleansed. But if we walk in the light, we continue to be cleansed by that precious blood of Christ. Sin is a separation, but if there is no sin, meaning that, that, that our sin is continually cleansed because we continue to walk in the light, we continue to keep that separation away from, from us and God. And we can have fellowship with Him. As we read about in Ephesians, the second chapter. What a great thing it is. Christ also saves us from all condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. Notice the condition. There is no condemnation now to them that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh. There's the condition. You walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made us free from the law of sin and death. What is that referring to? That's that bondage to sin back in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin are death. Verse 3, for what the law, this is the law of Moses, could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a man, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, or He overcame the power of sin, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We walk in the light. The law could not be used to justify one. Righteousness could only be obtained by keeping the law perfectly. That is, keeping it the way that Christ kept it without having any sin. The law of Moses was given to show us what sin is and show us that we needed a way to have sin removed. Romans chapter 7 and verse 13, Paul writes this about the law. Was then that which is good made death unto me? He's referring to the law. God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. When you, uh, when you get a speeding ticket and you go before the judge, you go in there and you want that, you want that ticket removed, you say, I appeal to the law. Absolutely not. Because you broke the law. You appeal to the law, you're going to get punishment. We don't appeal to the law. We want to appeal to mercy. We want to appeal to grace. So thankful for Christ and in Christ, under Christ, under the law of Christ, we can have those, those sins forgiven. Those transgressions, we can have those forgiven. There's grace and mercy. We have an advocate if we walk in the light, that faithful obedience, we are justified by that faith. Romans chapter 4, verses 13, starting in verse 13, talking about Abraham and his faith. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, or punishment for disobedience. For where no law is, there is no transgression. That's what the law shows us. Shows us what sin is. Therefore, it is of faith, not just mental assent, not that I believe this, but that I'm willing to act upon this like Abraham did. Obedience, that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, 
who is the father of us all. We're talking about walking in the light, not just recognizing that there is a light. We're talking about walking in it. We're talking about faithful obedience. Justification by faith. Verse 18 says, Who against hope, talking about Abraham, who against hope, man's hope, believed in hope. That blessed assurance, that heavenly hope. That's what Abraham did. That's what we should do. Reading on, he staggered not at the promise in verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in the faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded or assured, fully assured that he, what he had promised he was able to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness or it was counted to him, set to one's account, the word imputed there, set to his account, not that he had earned it or had merited it by any means, but God imputed it to him for righteousness. Verse 23, Now it was not written for his sake alone, but it was imputed to him, but for, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed at the moment that we act in the, in the manner that Abraham did with the faith he had. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who has delivered us from our offenses and has raised us again for our justification. The whole idea is that Christ died for us and that we by faith appropriate those blessings of His, of His death. We are treated as if we had not sinned when in all actuality we have. And Abraham did as well. What, a hope, what hope we have in this statement. That we have justification. We can be cleansed. We can have our sins wiped away and all this is in Christ. We understand what Christ can do. And that's why we continue to labor on. That's why we don't look back. We're so thankful for these blessings that we have in Christ. That hope that we have that's written in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, that is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, of which entereth into the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then if you were to read on in Romans in chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, because we walk after the Spirit, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Verse 2, the latter part, Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In verse 5, hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. What a great hope we have in Christ. What are some of the things that are in Christ? Ephesians 1 and verse 3, all spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1 and verse 7, the forgiveness of sins. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11, eternal life. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, salvation. Romans 8 and verse 39, the love of God. Think about the love of God and us being a child of God. Romans 8 verse 39, Nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we are a child of God, what a great feeling it is as a child to have a parent that loved you or someone in your life that loved you and took care of you and you felt safe and secure with. Now think about that from the spiritual aspect. If we have the love of God and the blessings that would come down from the Father because He loves us and He would take care of us. It's a great thing to think about. We labor on because of what Christ has done, but also of what He will do. Won't it be great to hear these words well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew chapter 25 verse 21. Or what about what Revelation 2 and verse 10 tells us about receiving that crown of life? Great thing to look forward to. Or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17, when the Lord comes back, as Paul was explaining to them about some of those that had died before the Lord returned and explaining to them what would take place. In verse 17 he says, Then 
We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so ever be with the Lord. What a great thing to think about. Revelation 21 and verse 4 that there will be no tears, no death, no pain, no sorrow. Revelation 22 verse 5 that we will reign with Him forever and ever. Friends, we labor on because we know what Christ can do, what He can do for us. We also labor on because we know what the gospel can do. And we want to take that gospel to others. It is God's power to save, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. It's what Paul took to Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The gospel brings many things. It brings riches, healing, deliverance, sight, freedom. Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. It brings riches, spiritual riches. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. It brings comfort, true comfort. Comfort and healing. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. It brings freedom from sin. tells us how. And in verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The gospel also brings us other things. It brings us peace, purity, hope, strength, and acceptance. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infamous, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye were washed, what peace we have being baptized into Christ. We were washed, but you were sanctified. What purity being set apart for a purpose. But you were justified as we've talked. What hope, what strength, what acceptance we know that we will have in that justification. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, the gospel contains great promises. Great hope, great encouragement. That's why we labor on. We want to take those things to others. And we enjoy thinking about those things. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter writes to us and says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. All things. Everything that we know how to live in this life so that we can be prepared for the next has been given to us. Through the knowledge of Him that called us to the glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. Those great promises. We as Christians lean on the gospel because... We know of the great comfort it has. We know that all of our physical needs in order for us to keep on living a spiritual life will be provided for us. We know that it it teaches us we have forgiveness of sins if we will only be obedient. We can have the remission of our sins. We can be cleansed. We've talked about that. Christ set those things up for us in His great sacrifice. Most importantly, we have eternal salvation. We have a reward. We have an inheritance. Peter wrote about it in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, that it's uh, incorruptible, it's undefiled, it fadeth not away, it's reserved in heaven for you in 1 Peter 1 and verse 4. That's what we have to look forward to. So friends, that's why we labor on. Because we don't want the defilement of sin... We don't want something that's going to destroy our lives and ultimately cause us to lose our soul. We labor on because we know of the great things that Christ has done and that He will do in the words that we want to hear Him say. 
And we labor on because we know what the gospel can do. And we know if we take the gospel to others, they can enjoy these great promises and have that true hope. Not hope as man uses it. I hope maybe this will come to pass. Or I hope that. No, true hope. Something that you can lay hold on. It's an anchor to the soul. That's what we look forward to. And we labor on because of it. Do you feel like laboring on? Do you take great joy in what Christ can do? Do you take great joy in the gospel and what it can do? Do you realize what sin can do? Sin fights against all these things, all these great things, these promises, and all the things that we can enjoy in that eternal abode with God. Tonight we're going to talk about why some do look back. This morning we're talking about why we labor on tonight, why some look back. Why some quit and go back out into the world. Are you in the labor force? Are you a Christian? Do you feel like traveling on? I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. We have an invitation song that is prepared for us. And as we sing it and as the day goes on, why don't we think about these things, about why we labor on, and let us hold on to these things. Won't you come now as we stand and sing?